So why don't we go ahead and uh, go ahead and kick this off. It looks like folks are all coming in here. Again, I encourage you to make use, liberal use of the chat. As I said, I'm Lisa Brush with the Stewardship Network, and I'm really pleased to be here today with Mitch Leto, an amazing um, ecologist and restorationist and great entertainer as well, Mitch. Um, so Mitch is the Stewardship Director at the Southwest Michigan Land Conservancy. And for those of you who are not familiar with the Stewardship Network, we are a 501c3, and our mission is to connect, equip, and mobilize people and organizations to care for land and water in their communities. And so to that end, we are really the capacity builders providing the tools and resources to help keep you all outside and doing the amazing stewardship work and the connections that you have uh, to each other and to the work that you do in your community. So thank you all for the work that you do. We are a national and international award-winning model um, for revolutionizing the way that land and water is cared for. And seven years after we started, we're now 20 years old, we were called the up and coming conservation organization with the right trajectory. So it's been a real privilege to work with you all over the years. Um, and at the Stewardship Network, partnerships and collaboratives are the name of the game. We partner with all volunteer NGOs to international NGOs, municipal, state, federal, tribal governments, consultants and contractors, students, researchers, private property owners, you name it. You all are part of the network if you are out in your communities caring for land and water. Speaking of member communities, those, those are our local affiliates. They are geographically place-based sub-networks of all of the organizations and individuals that care for land and water in a, in a community. And then it's all about ecosystem and community resilience and restoration. And so the neat thing that we do is then link those communities together uh, so that they can learn from each other and accelerate and amplify the work that we do all across the country. So if you're interested in learning more about those, feel free to uh, reach out to us. We're really pleased to uh, hold the 15th conference. We, uh, when we first did that conference 15 years ago, we had no idea what it would become. And it's really become a beloved event for many people. And so what we did is we've invited all of our past keynotes back. And so they will be joining us for live presentations uh, throughout uh, three days in January 26th, 27th, and 28th in 2022. We were able to have a uh, really great interactive session last time last year. People said, you know, only you all could make it seem like a real live, interactive, connected event. And so we're going to do that again. So looking forward to joining us, visit the conference website. I want to thank you all online who are financial contributors to the Stewardship Network. You enable us to do these free online monthly webcasts that we've been doing, getting on nearly 200 of them uh, each and every second Wednesday back way before we had these things. And it was a thing to it was a thing to be together like this all the time. So really, thank you all so much for your financial contributions. You enable us to continue to do the work. And with that, I want to say a shout out to Rich. Good to see you. It's been a while also. Um, but I want to turn it over to Mitch. As I said, Mitch Leto is the Stewardship Director with the Southwest Michigan Land Conservancy, and I'm Lisa Brush here with the Stewardship Network. I will, yeah, exactly, Jason. I'm a, I'm a Mitch Leto fan club too, right? Well, let's, let's start it. Um, I want to also, yes, Charlie, I am actually outside. So I'm, I'm really outside. I'm not. <laughs> it's a beautiful- I'm a poor substitute. <laughs> exactly. It's a good substitute. We, we look like we could be in the same place, right? Um, I am, I want to just also encourage you all to make liberal use of the chat. I will keep track of those questions as they come in and we'll pepper them throughout. So with that, Mitch, take it away. Okay, I go ahead and share my screen here. And how's that looking, Lisa? I see your mouth moving, but I don't hear you. I think that's a yes. That's right, I muted so that I could go into the background. Yes, it looks good. <laughs> okay. Um, great. Everything look good? Yep. All right. Well, I'll go ahead and get started. It's really um, an honor to be here. Um, I always have fun working with the folks at the Stewardship Network, go to the conference every year, wouldn't miss it for the world. And so I'm really delighted um, that I was invited to, to share some of the stories um, from my work. I'm calling stories from the understory and overstory, lessons learned from our plant partners. So I've been working for this organization, the Southwest Michigan Land Conservancy, for almost going on 10 years now. And um, I started to think about you know, how I could distill down some of the lessons I've learned from the work and from the, the, the landscape and the process. And I had just finished reading one of Robin Wall Kimmerer's great books, Gathering Moss. Um, you may have heard of Breaking Sweetgrass. I think um, there's one I hear about a little bit more. Both terrific books, but she has a great way of blending uh, indigenous worldview and traditional ecological knowledge with, with Western 
science and um, through the lens of plants, making careful observations of plants and ecosystems and learning um, from them as teachers. And so very much want to pay homage to her. I was inspired by her sort of format of, of uh, distilling her restoration lessons. And so I used that um, for this presentation. And, and so sorry, Mitch, 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 just a quick comment. On. Yep, yep, go ahead. So the uh, um, you were in presenter view right now, actually. So if you could do the full screen presentation of your, I think you maybe if you end the presentation. What I'll do is I wanted to avoid looking at my second screen, but I can do that. I think if I share screen too, would that look That's better? Perfect. Yep. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. Thanks for letting me know. <laughs> so, um, all right. Let's get back into slide advance here. So just brief outline, I'll talk a little bit about my organization, Southwest Michigan Land Conservancy, which has the moniker Swimlick, um, for better or for worse. And I'll go through three stories uh, for me and talk about um, a plant that represents that lesson um, for me and uh, talk about a story, my experience and uh, memory um, from that experience. And then, you know, what lesson did I essentially distill um, from that plant and from that experience. And I'll have kind of a little interactive bit where folks can try to identify the plant on the screen. Um, I can't see the chat from my perspective. So Lisa, maybe you can, oh no, there it is. Okay. Yep, I'll definitely, I'll definitely do that. It is, it is a little awkward, right? With those two screens. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Yes. I'll and then we'll have time for questions. Great. So let's see. Okay, so this um, this is the this is my world essentially. This is what what we call when we say Southwest Michigan. This is what we mean. So we're a regional land trust. Um, there are lots of us in Michigan. Um, Michigan is in very good company as far as land trusts and across the country as well. Everybody, you know, every group has a little bit different um, focal area that they work in. When we say Southwest Michigan, this is what we mean. And first and foremost. Um, I'd like to, you know, acknowledge the Potawatomi Nation, this place that I've come to love um, and know better over the years, um, are the, you know, traditional um, and contemporary homelands of, of that nation, and really were the first uh, folks to be managing this landscape, um, and we still have a lot, lot to learn in that regard as well. There are nine actual municipal counties in this area. It's over three million acres. So I always like to point out that one way of looking at it is it's about the size of the state of Connecticut. Uh, from another perspective, it's about the size of Yellowstone National Park. So kind of from east to west there gives you a sense of how much physical area um, we work in. And over 30 years, we're celebrating our 30th anniversary this year, we've protected 18,000 acres um, in one way or another. And so this scatter shot of little colored polygons here uh, represent those different places um, that we protected um, in those nine counties. Um, and I also have to mention that as uh, our organization and as a uh, land trust, we are a nonprofit. So folks often think we're the DNR or we get tax revenue, but we're really just driven, like the stewardship network, we're driven by support from the community um, and the folks that live, live there and support us. So thanks to all who do that. And a little bit of a, a nuts and bolts about those 18,000 acres and how we actually work. Um, so we have two main tools that we use that are referred to as conservation easements and nature preserves. Um, the conservation easements are tax-based incentives. So based on income, property taxes, these are things that have been supported in Congress for years, believe it or not, in a bipartisan way. These are private lands, so they can still be bought and sold and passed down to children and heirs. But essentially they limit development to a very specific part of the property. Um, and enter into a permanent conservation agreement to protect the conservation values, things like water quality, wildlife habitat, things that folks in this room uh, value a lot. And we have a hundred, uh, more than a hundred of these individual, we call them CE uh, projects. Obviously it can be private and they're um, tax benefits. So that's the certainly the more popular version. The other version is, uh, I'll show my bias where things get really interesting as when the Southwest Michigan Land Conservancy as a collective of its volunteers, members, board members, um, staff and the community that we work in um, get to be the owner and manager and for wildlife habitat, endangered species, 
forest health, we have a lot of different reasons to be uh, managing and involved in those lands. Some of these places are donated. Some of them are um, purchased by our organization um, through grant funding. And many of them are open to the public. Uh, we have a great list of them on our website that you can visit. They're free dawn to dusk, 365 days a year. Uh, we also have a number of sites that have limited access due to just smaller organizational capacity or um, sensitive habitats, sensitive species, that sort of thing. And there are 50 of these individual places all the way from four acres to almost 400 acres um, in size that total about uh, 4,000. So in that entire map and scope and that number, um, those are essentially the different tools that we use to work in our community. Hey, and Mitch, and the yes. one, one question thinking about protected acres. Um, so you all have done 18,000. Billy asks, do you know how much land is protected in all of your nine county region? Like with other, yeah. Actually, yeah, I don't know the acreage offhand, but you may have heard of the 30 by 30 and the 50 by 50. We have Two, the two biggest pieces of public land in Southern Michigan are Allegan State Game Area and Barry State Game Area. I did a very rough back of the bar napkin uh, kind of tabulation and it's about 30% um, of our landscape that's been protected in one way form or another. I tried to take out like golf courses and um, right. cemeteries and things like that. But so that's generally, that's my, that's my rough thought. Right, great, thanks for that. Yeah, no, awesome question. And yeah, the last thing I'll mention is that I think one thing that's kind of set our organization apart and is why we blend so well with the stewardship network is that restoration and stewardship has always been part of our, our brand, our form of conservation. Um, of course, it's not anything new. People have been doing this for a long time, but the set it and forget it kind of conservation model, if you will, where something's protected and it's set aside and people aren't allowed to go there and that's the best way to do it. Um, in our view, you know, a lot of times that's not, that's not the best way um, to do things because natural areas need our help more than ever. And frankly, people need natural areas now more than ever. And so it's a really good fit. And so when we say conservation, we mean after the paperwork and the talk of the legacies and the relationship building and the ink has dried, you know, in some ways the, the work has just begun because that's when we get a chance to do things like this, where you see folks doing everything from picking up trash to whacking buckthorn to building trails, putting in signs and distributing native plant seed, um, patching erosion, all sorts of things like that. Um, and, you know, it's a responsibility um, and a privilege to, to look after these places in the collective form. And so this is really um, a big pillar of, of what we do as an organization. All right, and then I'm gonna hop right into our first story. So I think I have the chat. Anyone want to make a, a guess as to what not the not the animals, but the plant on the screen is? What species? Joe. Yep. Yes, Joe Pieweed. I see milkweed. I that's another that's another uh, great wildflower that has a very similar color. Yep. So eutrochium. Uh, let's see, back to my advance. Eutrochium maculatum, they changed the name on us in the last uh, couple of years. So Joe Pieweed, AKA Pollinator Buffet. I say that because anytime I try to find a picture of it, I, I can't find one without a bee on it or a butterfly. And you can actually see there's a sweat bee up there and a little larva of some kind down there. Um, so yes, very great wildflower native plant. Um, lots of great uh, applications. And that is gonna be the, the segue into our first story. So the place that this story takes in is one of our, um, takes place in is one of our preserves called Bone the Clouds. Um, this is a map of Bone the Clouds with the black boundary being the outline of the preserve there. Um, it's about 60 acres. And what's really cool is that it's within the city limits of Kalamazoo. So, um, the fact that our largest metropolitan area, the no largest concentration of people in our entire service area, you know, have access to a natural area within the city limits is pretty incredible. Um, and so there are a lot of opportunities there um, with that. And uh, this place was donated to our organization by the Sisters of St. Joseph, which if you look into the history of Kalamazoo, had a really 
um, integral part of um, the more recent chapter of the, of the area. And that was they had a charter to um, establish a, a convent and a hospital, um, as well as a liberal arts college. So this is actually a postcard from 1906 showing Nazareth Academy, which was later Nazareth College up until the 90s. And in the background of that postcard, you can see a little tree line, you can see kind of some rolling hills, um, and it sort of drops off from your perspective. Um, and that is essentially that southern boundary on the map. So that's where the story uh, kind of begins there. And as you might imagine, with an area that's surrounded by, you know, a lot of hardscaping and residential and urban development, um, with the huge potential, there are some huge hurdles there. So without a, you know, hefty endowment to, to manage the property. We knew we were going to be applying for grants and working really hard to try to make this place healthier ecologically. And so much of the upland looked like the photo in the lower left. All your favorite offenders, uh, buckthorn, autumn olive, multiflora rose, that sort of thing. And then the wetlands, um, if they weren't covered in glossy buckthorn thickets, they had this hybrid cattail infestation, which is a blend of a native and a non-native species um, that really, really lowers diversity and grows in a different way than our native cattail. So um, from upland to wetland, we had a lot of work ecologically to do. And like sort of a typical um, good land manager, you know, we, we stepped back and we framed out the area and we thought, you know, uh, what, kind of, what kind of habitat, what kind of system are we gonna strive for in these different areas? And so you can see this map identifies different sort of um, natural communities, loosely based off of Michigan Natural Features Inventory natural community descriptions. Um, so you can see in the upland areas, the light orange and the green on the lower right. We've got oak savannas on the south facing slopes, oak woodlands on the north facing slopes. And then that central area, that wetland, um, we had seen remnants of a uh, southern wet meadow. Um, and we also wanted to have shrub islands, uh, native shrub islands for the benefit of uh, overwintering, nesting and migrating uh, birds and to provide some structural diversity there. And you can see in the upper right, there's some uh, more open kind of more heavily used um, open space where, where some of the old buildings used to be. And so I won't go into uh, detail about how to control specific invasive species because there's lots of good information out there about that but I'd like to just kind of focus on our, our general process and sort of the things that we were doing to try to achieve, you know, something that looked like this, this sort of vision. And so we're doing things like this. You see a lot of these volunteer work days where folks are going out with loppers. This is a college group on Martin Luther King Day. Um, we do almost every year go out and identifying specific plants, um, cutting them in the upland areas, and bringing back the essential disturbances that the indigenous peoples of this area were tending and burning these areas routinely. Um, and many of them haven't seen fire for you know, 100, 150, maybe more years. And so really helping our restoration efforts and just bringing back the disturbance regime that this landscape evolved with. Um, and also starting to uncover some interesting features as we're literally peeling back the curtains of buckthorn and other invasive species. Um, it really changes your perspective of the landscape and literally reveals features. So there's a little pink oval over there on the map. I don't know how well you can see that, but it's um, this area called the Swan Pond. The sisters called it the Swan Pond, spring fed pond that uh, waterfowl would come to in the wintertime when everything else was frozen over. And after about three or four hours, um, initially, we kind of opened up this view and revealed a water feature we literally didn't even know was there. Um, so really starting to, to kind of peel back the edges. And then in 2018-19, a uh, group that's been volunteering almost every week for uh, almost 20 years now spent an entire winter um, 170 people hours on clearing out this area, revealing the pond and trying to bring back some, some healthy native plants um, and ecosystem function to this area. We had this great finale where we burned, uh, burned down the, the brush piles, these little like Viking pyres around the, around the pond and returned some of that ash to mineral soil and really um, kicked off the process. Um, in addition, in some of the upland areas, we're finding really 
incredible things like this massive uh, oak tree, this matriarch oak tree here, which the first time I visited the property, I was standing 10 yards away from the tree and I literally couldn't even see it. Um, the buckthorn and the black locust uh, were so thick that you didn't really have a lot of spatial orientation and awareness because we were huddled down and walking down these, these deer trails. So this landscape needed a lot of help, but it wasn't with, without great reward. Um, and these were some of our, our rewards that we were, we were getting in, in sort of um, that sense. So of course we called it the mighty oak. And if you visit the preserve today, you can't not see the mighty oak. It's one of the first things you notice when you start walking into the preserve. In addition, we we're clearing out along these beautiful um, streams and you're seeing natural contours, streams and waterways doing things that they're supposed to do. They're not ditched and channelized. They have these great meanders and gravel bottoms and um, babbling cold water. And then our, our swan pond project um, in particular, I'd, I'd like to talk about a little bit. So this is what the pond looks like um, from, from an aerial perspective. I was dug probably in the 60s or 70s, which is probably why there's a lot of buckthorn there. So you can see the shape um, is a little bit intentional um, in that way. But we had a seed mix ready, right? So we thought we know best. A lot of times if we remove invasives, all we get is more invasives. So we wanted to be ready. So we had a seed mix and we broadcasted it over that area we cleared out that I showed in the previous slide um, in the spring. But even just a few months into the growing season, those, those species didn't even have a chance to germinate because nature started doing it all on its own. So we're seeing native uh, healthy plant communities that are you know, indigenous to those, to those wet meadow systems. We're seeing um, solid ego patula, rough leaf goldenrod, we're seeing bone set, um, eupatorium, we're seeing spotted uh, jewelweed and patients capensis, great blue lobelia, all of these beautiful and amazing native plants that were growing incredibly thick um, and uh, was actually a little difficult to walk through, um, but really just started doing the work for us. And so that was really heartening and inspiring. And one particular um, August afternoon, uh, we had been working with our local nature center, the Kalamazoo Nature Center, on a cattail control program. And I was going out, you know, one year after um, treating cattails to kind of see how things were looking. Um, and this is more or less what it looked like uh, before that time. And then I kind of peeked out uh, through some of those shrub islands and I looked over and this is literally what I saw. It looks like one of those those fake looking desktop backgrounds, but I... I kid you not, that was a photo that I took after walking out and looking at that area and my jaw dropped. I was totally floored and it was like this full body experience. So I can see this pinky purple, you know, you can see all the way to the horizon almost. Um, I could smell the fragrance from the flowers and in this sort of muggy August air, I could feel uh, and hear it too, because as I mentioned, these are pollinator powerhouses. So there were bumblebees, honeybees, and a ton of different um, native bees. And being the, the bug dork that I am, I was like, I got to get in the middle of this. So I carefully parted the flowers out of the way and just stood in the middle of it, hoping not to get stung, but just kind of experience everything that was coming back. And you could, you know, you could feel the energy coming back into that system that was, you know, formerly uh, much less uh, productive and biodiverse. And so it's kind of in that moment that I realized that in, in many cases, we can leverage the native seed bank, the nature that remains there uh, is resilient to the site by giving native plants the space that they need to thrive. And I will throw in a couple of caveats, um, of course. This is especially true in wetland soils. Wetland soils are terrific at maintaining um, and preserving seed life, seed banks. And this was paired with other activities, like you saw the fire, um, and you gotta imagine all the light that's coming into that system, the ground would be warming up with more light. So it sort of starts this, this snowballing of ecological changes that really help to bring back and support these native plants. So in some ways, you know, part of our restoration plan wasn't needed because nature you know, took care of it for us. And I can't think of a better plant to compete with hybrid cattail than uh, Joe Pieweed. You know, All right. It completely brings tears to my eyes, right? I mean, it's why we do the work that we do, right? It's just yep. so cool. And it never gets old. 
Right, exactly. And as everybody's saying in the comments, like, whoa, that's so awesome, so beautiful. And, and Marta says, the mighty oak, what kind of oak is it? As we're imagining ourselves there. I think that one is, sometimes when they get so old, like their bark looks so different, you can't tell. I'm pretty certain it's a red oak. Okay, great. And then we've got pig nut hickories of similar caliber in there. So kind of an oak hickory uh, duo there. That's awesome. And Billy asked, this was after burning, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I think so. I know we, we burned in different units and I can't remember. We have burned all of these areas. Yep. Um, but yeah, certainly it was all kind of playing together to support the same system. So that's awesome. Yeah. Great. Thanks. So yeah, wonderful story. And I, again, I'll mention, you can definitely visit these places. Go check them out every August. Um, there's, there's fireworks, you know, after the 4th of July, those are the fireworks. So, um, all right. So story number two, uh, looking at the, the tree in the background and that big crowning shape, anyone have a guess as to what species that is? Hey, Mitch, and as people are putting that in there, um, I was going to yeah. save it for the end, but maybe as people are dropping in the pieces in the chat about what, what is this? Um, what is the bee and wasp count up to at, at the last preserve? Do you know? We don't know. As, as you know, research isn't a formal part of, of my job description. I, I dabble in it, which I'll, I'll show kind of in the next story. Um, but we partner a lot with, um, you know, local universities and places like that that can better inform us of how well we're doing. So in this particular place, I'm not sure. But if whoever asked that is a is an entomologist and a BMWAS specialist, we would love their help. And our first our first guest, William Kurse, totally nailed it. So yes, this is a white oak. Um, and specifically, so it's this species, Quercus alba, one of my favorite trees, just a powerhouse of, of uh, ecosystem function and, and support of food webs. And specifically, I'm also referring to the form of the tree. So you can see one tree in the foreground is growing very straight with no lower branches, you know, probably grown in a competitive, more shady environment. That tree in the background is specifically what is called a wolf tree. And I think there's some debate as to where that term came from. But essentially, they're these old gnarly oaks that are clearly much older than all the trees around it. Um, and that's the one that's going to segue us into our next story. Uh, so as the, the, um, the name suggests, it's a very fitting place for a uh, name of a preserve, Wolf Tree Nature Trails. We actually had a naming contest because this preserve was nameless for a while. Um, and that was a name that somebody um, from the community suggested and we loved it. So uh, we went with that. So this was a donation of about 67 acres. Um, historically, it was in the largest area in Michigan of Black Oak Barrens. So this uh, Southwest Michigan flavor of the MNFI 1800 vegetation map. Um, you don't need to be able to see all the different colors and the legend there. Just know that that big orange blob in Western Kalamazoo County there, that's all Oak Barren. And this is basically right in the heart of that. Um, so that's sort of the ecological context, you know, historically. Um, and we noticed that the property had good bones, it had a beautiful woodland, had nice rolling land to it. Um, definitely had some, some good oaks and hickories, but it was pretty scruffy. Um, there was a lot of invasives and clearly had been um, loved really hard, I guess you could say, um, in the past as far as homesteading and things like that, potentially. But in general, we didn't know a lot of historical um, info about the property in terms of, of how it was used. Um, so, so that was sort of our, our somewhat limited understanding on the context of the preserve. But um, but there is, I mentioned, there's a lot of interesting topography on the property. So in Southwest Michigan, a thousand feet is pretty high. So this is the Kalamazoo Moraine, you know, the last advance before the, the glacier retreated back to Lake Michigan. Um, this is where they paused and broke apart, dropped these big blocks of ice that formed these little kettle bowls that you see in the upper right with those topography lines kind of cluster there. Um, and so some very neat um, topography on the property as well. So this is a modern aerial of the property. 
And as we started getting to know the property better, we started noticing that the Western half in particular, we see this little kind of opening um, was a little more weedy. I know that's totally a subjective um, term, but more uh, non-native plants, garden escapees, that sort of thing. So you see this uh, sweet pea is kind of a garden escapee. And a lot of it had that typical shrub haze that's right at eye level where you can't really see very far into the preserve. And frankly, it was kind of difficult to walk through in some places. And then the eastern half of the preserve, uh, gradually as you walk further into the preserve, we started seeing more conservative plants. Um, and if you're not familiar with that term conservative as it relates to plants, not politics, is that they're plants that are essentially attached to the way that things used to be. And as things change from that um, sort of pre-Columbian you know, state of things, they don't tend to hold on for very long. And there's sort of varying levels of this conservatism. But we we're seeing plants that were more conservative, more native, like the striped wintergreen and the American Columbo, which is like top five favorite plants. Please look it up. It's super interesting. Um, great savanna species. Uh, and had more of this open woodland character that you can see in the, in the lower right. And so starting to kind of piece a plan together, um, we felt justified because of the extensive amount of work um, involved and the extensive amount of degradation uh, to, to take a little more of a active hand in the restoration there. So we bought a commercial seed mix. We actually partnered with a contractor who's, or excuse me, an excavator who's gone restoration and they were pulling out autumn olive uh, by the roots with this large equipment, um, piling them up, chipping them, um, burning small brush piles, and opened up a lot of this uh, ground, which if you're not careful, can be uh, a new place for invasives to come in. So we put our seed mix on top of that, and we felt a little more justified using heavy-handed techniques, knowing that those upland seed banks tend to be really bad, um, and everything we were seeing was not you know, supporting that we were going to get good results by just letting the seed bank express itself there. And then on the eastern half, we were using lighter restoration techniques, if you will. So we're cutting things by hand. We're doing a little bit of canopy thinning to promote oak regeneration and the healthy understory diversity of plants that really need light. Um, and you know, because of the more intact nature of that part of the preserve, we took a lighter approach. And, and so- Can I get you before you on that last yeah. slide? Sure. Um, what's the name of the bottom middle plant? American Columbo. American Columbo. And were there Frisera, a lot? Frisera caroliniensis for, for the Latin speakers. Um, nice. Nice. Not that I speak Latin, but yes, American Columbo. But you speak plant. <laughs> yeah, trying to, learning the language. So, so yeah, our question was, um, you know, this section doesn't seem to be, you know, as beat up as the other part of the preserve, uh, so to speak, you know, could we rely on the seed bank here? Um, or should we buy seed, collect seed and broadcast? You know, we'd like to let nature kind of express itself if possible. On the Western half, we decided that that wasn't something we were going to, um, you know, gamble on. Uh, so we decided not to, and we used our own seed mix there, but how could we essentially decipher whether we could rely on the seed bank at all or not? And so, um, I said that we don't do research, and this is my kind of half-hatched version of a research project, but um, essentially I, I uh, measured out these different units and these little white um, circles you see in there are places where I collected seeds from the, from the seed bank. How do you do that, you might ask? It's pretty incredible, but pretty much every handful of soil you pick up has seeds in it. Plants are really, really good at spreading themselves around and they make these time capsules and archives by doing so because only so many seeds can germinate every year. And so essentially what we did was go in with a, a standard soil core, it went down 10 centimeters, which uh, as it turns out, tends to be where most of the seeds are. Partnered with a local native plant grower, um, Chad Hewson at uh, Hidden Savannah Nursery and put them on sterilized potting soil, um, distributed them out, uh, he watered and tended them uh, for me, and then we would periodically go back and try to identify uh, the plants that came out. And then we wanted to, in those same areas, actually go look and see what are the green plants, what are what's actually growing out there above ground. 
um, and compare the two. And so we uh, uh, partnered with several of our volunteers who are gifted botanists um, and were, were uh, willing to put in the time and essentially inventory these, these units. And what we found was pretty amazing. So uh, P1, that unit up there, 0% of the species that came out of the seed bank were found growing there. So it had nothing in common with the, the sort of archival seed bank that was in the soil with what was growing above ground. Uh, P2 had about 30% in common, but more or less what this was telling us was that there were very dissimilar um, species in the, in the sort of archive seed bank community um, and the above ground um, you know, community of green plants that were growing there and just totally baffling uh, to me and really started started us scratching our heads about the history of the site and how it used to look and how we should manage it and those sorts of things. So your next question is, well, what were some of the seeds that, uh, what did some of those seeds germinate into essentially? So here's a little bit of a scatter shot of some of the plants. So starting in the upper left and going counterclockwise, we have water whorehound, um, soft stem rush, we have uh, staghorn sumac, Spotted St. John's wort, black raspberry, common mullein, um, slender sand sedge, and rough fruited sinkfoil, some native, some non native. And without going into the details on every single species, essentially what this was telling, uh, at least my interpretation, was that at one time this place was wetter, sunnier, and more disturbed than, than what we see today with this sort of stable, shady, you know, wooded system. And so really got us, yeah, scratching our heads. And so we had some native, some, some non-native um, seed bank uh, in these areas. And so really got us thinking about history. And so you start digging into the history more. So this is a 1998 um, aerial image. And on the, on the where that kind of um, cut out in the upper right corner is, uh, I'd like to direct your attention over there. I'm not sure if you can see my mouse or not, but um, in this area, there, this is where that deep kettle is, and there's no um, standing water in this area, although it looks like there should be. It looks like there could be a pond or a small water feature there, but you can see the white um, reflectivity is bare soil there, so no water in 1998. And then after a series of heavy um, spring rains in the late 2010s, um, in this little circle there, you can see this little dark portion pop up, and this is what it looked like on the ground. So all of a sudden we have this two to three acre wetland feature. Um, it was a still body of water, wasn't flowing, but essentially popped up after a number of rains. And keep in mind, I mentioned that this is very high in the local landscape. So the water should be running off of this area to other surface water bodies. But this kettle began to hold this water and it hasn't gone dry since. And so then, okay, some of the wetland species are, are making more sense why we would find those in the seed bank and really just kind of humbled me as far as, you know, I don't know, I don't know much about this land. I thought I did, um, but really starting to kind of pick it apart. And it really came home to me when we dug up a 1938 aerial image and this is what the property looked like. So the boundaries um, aren't exactly the same, but more or less you can see there's an obvious, obvious difference um, 80 years later. And if you walked out there today, you'd never imagine that this is what it looked like. But in the 30s, we were farming pretty much wall to wall. And so uh, a kind of crash course on interpreting some of these images, the real light areas are usually tilled soil. Um, and so they reflect this kind of a white color from the aerial uh, photograph. The light gray areas are, are grass or pasture areas. Uh, you can see that sort of grid um, of dots here. That's an orchard. So you can see there's a lot of orchard um, apple trees in this area. And in fact, there was um, lead arsenic in the soil, which is a common uh, pesticide used in orchard um, in that area. But in the more intact portion of the preserve in, in a kind of uh, modern sense, you can see that there are still some clusters of trees in those areas and that that probably is dictating why we're seeing you know, more scruffy, more invasive non-native plants in the western half um, and more native intact system on the eastern half because those mature trees were right there and were able to reforest it more quickly. And if you look on kind of the bottom middle, 
oh, sorry, I have these pictures too. So we actually managed to connect with the, the family that owned it before the donor that donated to us. Um, and he had it for 40 years. So we're talking like 1940s here. Um, this family owned it and you can see how open the landscape was. It was a homestead. There was lots of tilled ground. There were orchards around. And so it really gives you a perspective as to how different of a place this was. Um, and then I'd like to direct your attention over here. So these little broccoli clusters over here are the, are the canopies of the trees that remained you know, on the property at that time. And sometimes you can pick out like an individual tree. And so this one with the pink circle on it here coming full circle is our wolf tree that we uh, met at the beginning of the story. And so you can walk out to the preserve today and see this tree, of course, it's in much greater company in terms of there's lots of trees around it. Um, and just really brought home to me that how important history is. It informs what we make in terms of our management and stewardship decisions. And it really drives you know, what outcomes are, po are possible and what we're likely to see when we start trying to restore these places. Um, and so some great uh, resources for history for, for your site or for your area, if you're interested, 1938 aerials are probably one of the best resources. Um, MSU has a digital archive. You can pay for images. You can also go to your local conservation district. Um, they'll often have those. And then you can often get surveyor notes. So in the 1830s, when they were looking at expanding agriculture into the Midwest, Surveyors walked section lines with rods and chains, and they made notes of which trees were growing and what the soil was like. Um, so you can kind of pair those things together, and that's actually how the um, 1800 vegetation maps were produced um, in part with MNFI and our Department of Natural Resources, which is also a great resource to give you sort of a pre-settlement uh, pre context of what the landscape might have looked like. And then, of course, never overlook actual people, you know, verbal um, history of some areas. We learned a lot from connecting with that family and the folks who had lived on that landscape and tended it before us. Also keep in mind that the seed bank is history. A uh, big proponent of, of doing this really simple um, seed bank activity. I think it could be a service that consultants and native plant nurseries could offer. It's also something you could do yourself. Um, learning to read the landscape. Now, whenever I see a tree like that, of course, I'm like, oh, I'm imagining what the landscape looked like, you know, 80 years ago, 100 years ago, and I can already start to form some, some rough ideas. And then in the, you know, academic discipline of restoration ecology, you hear this term land use legacy. And it's really just saying that the way that land was treated historically really can drive what we see in terms of outcomes. So you can take the same system um, that's been treated in two different ways, and you're likely to have two different results as far as what we see today when we start to do restoration. So that's sort of a, a concept that, that um, relies largely on history. All right, and then last story, I'm gonna got kind of a macro shot here. So anybody wanna take a guess as to what this little beauty is? Okay, and Mitch, as those are coming in, questions about the, about the past yep. site, wolf tree. Um, what were the soils like in that in that area? Were they were they woodland yeah. soils? Steve Jeff asks, you know, wet. Yeah. So, so generally they're they're pretty gravelly and sandy. Um, but when we did take those soil cores, when we went down that south facing bank into the bottom of the kettle, towards the bottom there was some finer textured clay and things like that that mm -hmm. probably supported those wetland species. So pretty much uh, Ashimo Sandy Loam, if you want the specific name, exactly. Ashimo Sandy Loam. So yeah, so and uh, Drew, Drew got it right off the bat. We've got some, uh, got some ardent botanists in here. So yes, let me go back to my slides. Yep, so this is Yellow Pond Lily, Nufar Advina. I don't know if that's how you pronounce that also known as spatter dock. So uh, if you saw it like this, uh, you, would, you would know right away, it's this emergent plant with these sort of floating uh, emergent leaves. And all this has this cool flower that looks like it's gonna open a little bit more, but always just kind of stays in that tight um, cluster that way. So as you might guess, this next story is gonna be about water. 
And the name of this preserve, also a little uh, foreshadowing, is called Hidden Pond. So uh, the, the preserve is shown in kind of a modern aerial in the lower right. And then going back to those 1800 vegetation maps, we know how important history is now. So uh, we're looking at it in that context uh, where the yellow star is there. This was a donation around the same size as the last uh, preserve and really in an oak dominated landscape. So um, you can see the, the star there, the various colors around it are all oak based systems, oak hickory forest, mixed oak forest, um, oak barrens, those sorts of things. So very much would have been a you know, drought prone, sandy soil, fire adapted landscape. Um, this project specifically, this is Berry State Game Area outlined in the green there. And you can see some of those little holes in that shape are, um, are private lands that are not you know, protected or under the, under the state of Michigan um, DNR's uh, discretion there. And so that property in particular was going to become a housing development, um, likely a bedroom community for the city of Grand Rapids. And uh, a donor family actually purchased it with the intent of uh, doing conservation and preserving that landscape, um, pre preventing that from happening, um, and donated it to us. And we essentially got it in the form of a tired old farm. Um, so it had been, again, used really, really well. I'll skip to the 1938. Now that we know how important they are, we'll just start with the 1938. So again, farming wall to wall. Um, not a lot of intact uh, forest cover. You're seeing the light areas that were tilled. You're seeing the light gray areas that were grazed with cattle. Um, in the lower left, you can see some of those dark drainage patterns um, in the soil kind of emerging there. And then skip ahead, you know, 60 years or so, 1999. Um, some things look the same. You can still tell it's being actively farmed, actively grazed, but the landscape around it is starting to fill in. So a lot of those farms were abandoned. It was a really tough place to eke out a living. Um, I mentioned the poor soils. So you're start, starting to see some of those, that tree cover and that kind of rewilding, reforesting happening there. And so there were, um, at the time of the, the purchase and donation of the property, there were still some pretty big um, some old farmhouse on the property, uh, a very old dairy barn, and if you know what dairy animals do, um, pun intended, they uh, make a lot of waste and periodically that stream was used to flush out the barn and uh, deposit it downstream. So kind of amazed at the ingenuity, but also horrified at the you know, ecological impacts of that um, at the same time. Um, waterways were clearly altered. They were ditched and channelized and had very steep um, banks, reed canary grass on either side. And this, other corner of the property, which you can't see from the, the entrance, there was this low wet spot. And we very much had a, um, a verbal, you know, kind of exchange of history with the former uh, farmer and, and landowner family and said, you know, there's always this wet spot in this field, I could never quite get dry enough to plant corn in. Um, and so we thought, yeah, maybe we want to do a wetland restoration project there. I don't know, we'll see. So essentially, we've got structures we have to take care of, and they were um, disassembled and taken off site. We've got damaged soils that have been tilled pretty much every year for almost a century, probably. Um, very little, you know, probably no organic matter left at all. And then we've got altered hydrology. And it's that last piece that I'd like to focus on, um, namely, but I'll say in terms of the soils, um, we started uh, with 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 great success, I would say, you know, planting those areas, trying to stabilize the soils. And again, being in that fire prone landscape, we wanted to have habitats that would complement the surrounding landscape. So um, we worked on prairie and oak savanna restorations. And there's lots of great resources about how to do these sort of agricultural conversions. There's lots of companies and consultants that um, do the seed drilling. And so you're starting to see things like uh, Coreopsis and Lupin and Blazing Star coming into the system. And like any good prairie and savanna, you know, tender, we did a lot of burning on the landscape. And so things were looking really good. And just as kind of a reminder of what kind of impact we're having on a landscape level, um, this is an image of the DNR uh, Department of Natural Resources field um, on the north side of the property. And we actually used the same seed mix. It was just planted in a later year. And so this yellow, which is like 15 acres of yellow that you could see from Google Earth, um, 
is actually our friend uh, Rudbeckia herta. So it's a short-lived perennial wildflower. And if you've done any of these projects, you know, sometimes they come in really thick at the beginning and then kind of fade away. Um, but just the scale of it was really, really impressive just to see and I'm, you know, imagining all the pollinators out there. Um, so really kind of making a, a landscape scale impact there. So we're really happy about that. But then back to this hydrology question, um, hydrology is not as easy to understand, in my opinion. It is um, more expensive often. Um, there's permitting involved. There's, there's lots of different reasons why it's more complicated. And I guess just basic components that we're thinking of are how do we remove barriers to restore a more historical natural flow? Um, when you think of altered hydrology, you think of dams and culverts and things like that. Um, and so we did a number of hydrology fix projects out here. Um, and the one I'd like to focus on is that, um, that low wet spot. But this is a topographic map of the preserve. And so, you know, surface waterways are easier to understand. You know, two tributaries come together, they form a bigger tributary, it gains more flow, velocity, and, and size, and on downstream, it gains another tributary, and we can kind of see what's going on there. The groundwater um, is a little harder to understand, but essentially it's going to be flowing downhill, right? So if you look at those topographic lines, it's going to be going, you know, perpendicular to them um, from the high points, so it's going to be draining off in those various directions. Um, and the, the wet spot that the farmer could never plant is this kind of saddle over here that doesn't quite conform to the way that these topographic lines, you know, want to come across here. And if it's just following the path of least resistance would have followed this path out of this saddle and down to the creek. Um, and actually talking to the farmer and landowner, he said, oh yeah, my great grandfather by hand, you know, six to 10 feet down, dug these tiles in. If you're not familiar with tiles, they're essentially just tubes. You know, historically they're made out of clay. Um, they're still used today, you know, somewhat to basically drain wetlands and lower the water table to make areas easier to farm or build on or that sort of thing. And so we were actually able to have the farmers help and go in and physically break those tiles. And so dig down essentially and just crush them, put the soil back on top, um, and what that did was slow down the water and, you know, should result in a more natural expression um, of water and allow it to, to flow more slowly, you know, through the soil and through the landscape. So I'll go through a series of aerial photos to give you a sense of, of kind of what transpired. So keep your eye on the, uh, this little wet spot down here. So this is 99. And then 2010, three years after the, the tiles were broken off that little saddle, you could see it totally filled up with water. So this is, you know, probably a little over an acre in size here. Here's a growing season shot and really didn't take, you know, but a couple of months to fill up. And so here's some sort of um, ground perspective shots and, you know, biodiversity was returning to, to this little area, which had been tilled and farmed, you know, for likely a hundred years. And so I mentioned we use seed mixes on the upland portions and my uh, mentor and predecessor, Nate Fuller, said, you know, we didn't buy any wetland seed because we didn't know how big the wetland was going to be or what kind of wetland it was going to be. So he thought, let's just observe it and see what happens. And so you can see a good density of our friend, uh, Nufar, of our yellow, yellow pond lily or spatter dock there um, growing. And whether it came in on duck feet or whether it was stored in that moist soil for a hundred years, this is an obligate wetland plant. It doesn't grow in sort of borderline, you know, wetland areas. It has to be standing water. So the fact that we're getting native cattails, wool grass, and yellow pond lilies coming up right away uh, was just an incredible testament to that seed bank again. So we're using native seed bank in the wetlands and we're using seed additions in the upland. Um, here's another perspective. On the animal front, it took literally no time at all. So the following spring, um, Nate said he went out there and there were tens of thousands of toad tadpoles, for some reason, all swimming counterclockwise around the pond. Um, I don't know if it's a sheep thing, but they're all just like following each other or something. But tons of frogs out there, um, toads are seeing invertebrates like damselflies and dragonflies coming in, the occasional grumpy snapping turtle we'd bump into out there. Um, wood ducks, sandhill cranes, 
it literally is amazing that, you know, it was sitting there for over a hundred years and within a couple of months, the animals are just acting like it was there the whole time. And so again, to see that hydrology bring back biodiversity was really incredible. I'm gonna to try to play a video here. So it's, it's playing for me, is it playing for you, Lisa? Great. So uh, I went out there in June to check in on one of our restoration projects. And this is what I saw. So there's this dragonfly emergence that had been happening. And I've never seen so many dragonflies in one, they're like bumping into me um, one place in my entire life. And uh, one of the species I was able to figure out is this beautiful, uh, really big um, species called a spatter dock darner. You can tell from their bright blue eyes and their big body size. And so the namesake of the dragonfly and the namesake of the spatter dock that were growing in those ponds, you look up information about it, it says that these species prefer, you know, spatter dock, water lily dominated, ponded, uh, fishless water bodies. And that was exactly what we, you know, had created there. And so to see the hydrology and the plants follow the hydrology and the animals follow the hydrology was just one of the coolest things that I think we've been able to do. And so it just brings home the fact that, you know, water is really foundational to these systems. Um, you know, the availability drives plant distributions from uphill to downhill, and it literally added new species onto the preserve that had not been there before. So growing the plant richness, slowing down that water and allowing it to percolate in a more natural way, supporting ecosystem function, and of course, nourishing that biodiversity um, that I gave a little snapshot of there. And so with that, um, yes, thank you very much for, for listening to, to my stories today. And I'd like to just kind of end with a couple of thoughts. You know, restoration is not a spectator sport or doesn't have to be. I think from a Monarch Way Station front yard level to a nature preserve, to a property, to a statewide level, um, really to, to have this cultural and ecological impact, we gotta be working on every level. Um, visit these preserves. All three of these preserves are publicly accessible. Um, and of course, you know, I can't be a good nonprofit employee without mentioning that we're totally dependent on memberships and uh, donations. And with that, I'll say thanks. Uh, we've got social media stuff, YouTube channel, all that. You can email me um, there if you'd like, if you have any more questions. And then I think we've got uh, a few minutes for questions, maybe. I think Maybe we one. I think we're round, I think we're rounding it up one o'clock at the top of the hour. But Mitch, thank you so much. That's this is it's why we do the work, right? And to see those stories and everybody is chiming in, so uplifting. Thank you for sharing your stories of successful restoration. Great presentation. You've really done a great job telling these stories. Time that more thing that more of us need to cultivate. Amazing and uplifting. Wonderful presentation. I'll be sharing this with other people. So Mitch, thank you so much, and thanks for the inspiration. And let's all get back out there. And then we'll come back together in December on the second Wednesday and tell more stories. And talk about it. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. That's Great. what con continues to inspire me too, is just hearing everyone else's stories and perspectives and knowing we're in it together. So that's exactly right. It really is. So great. Again, Mitch, thank you so much. And thank you all to all of you who joined us online. Really appreciate it. Hope you enjoy the rest of your day and the rest of the fall as we turn to winter here in, in, the, in the Great Lakes. And we'll look forward to being with you next month on the second Wednesday during the Eastern Time Zone's noon hour in December. Thanks, all. Hey, bye, everybody.